Yeah, my name's Chris Bates. I'm uh, Director of Research and Analytics at TPP. We are a UK-based digital health company. Uh, and I'm also a visiting research fellow at the University of Leeds uh, in the informatics department there. Um, very much like um, Charles said about Alejandro, I I'm going to start somewhere completely different. Um, and we will march towards common ground um, as, we, as we go on. But I suppose it's testament to the, to the breadth of SNOMED CT and what we can do with it. So what I'm going to talk to you about, to start with for the first few minutes, ten minutes or so, is about AI and deep learning and what we mean and what the context that is for healthcare. Move on to the roles of electronic health records and SNOMED CT as we start to develop in that space and then address some of the challenges and opportunities, uh, both the opportunities that SNOMED presents us but the challenges that we're still left to contemplate when we're working in this field. Um, my background is in academic mathematics, day to day. I'm a computer programmer and a data scientist, so uh, I'm allowed two or three clinical mistakes as we go on. So just to set the scene, I, I want to talk about what we, what we mean when we say AI. It's, you know, it's a term that's banded around a lot at the moment, and I, I, I think the best definition still is the original one. This is where the, the, the term was first coined uh, back in the 1950s, and this was uh, John McCarthy, who is one of the founding fathers of AI, and a guy called Claude Shannon, if you're a computer scientist in here, uh, the, the father of information theory. And, and their definition was that it, it's, it's AI, and it's artificial intelligence, if we can make machines behave in a way that if a human was doing that, we would deem it intelligent. Um, so we've seen today in the, in the, the plenary uh, ideas of, of when there's an algorithm now that can beat human beings at go. You know, it's... It, that, that is deemed as intelligent if a human can do that. It doesn't mean we're into artificial general intelligence and some sort of singularity. So we're not talking today about uh, the idea of AI replacing doctors. We're talking about engineering and science and task-driven things where the machine can, can really help our doctors and our nurses and, and citizens. You won't be able to read that. It doesn't matter. But again, when we say AI, it's a broad family. There's a very broad family of, of, of things we're talking about here. This is a a diagram by uh, Korea, and I've stolen this from uh, Floridi. And really this gives you an idea of all the different things. So along the bottom, and you can't see them, there's logic-based, knowledge-based, probabilistic, machine learning, embedded intelligence, and search and optimization. These are the different types of thing we've got. And they're trying to achieve slightly different goals, uh, all the way from knowledge and reasoning uh, up to kind of planning. So it's a very different, th so you've got to be very careful when you're talking AI, what is it we mean. Where the revolution has been in the last few years is here. Uh, in deep neural networks and machine learning. So this is, you know, it's mathematics, it's engineering-based tasks that have enabled us to do lots and lots of new things. So it's, that's the reason that the minister's Alexa demo works. Uh, it's the reason you can search for the, I don't know, you take your phone out and search for beach, and you'll find the photos of beaches, not because you tagged anything, but because Apple have, or, or Google have provided it with enough images for it to learn. So this is the real place that we're talking about where the revolution's been. The inspiration for that, I'm sure many of you know, comes from, from biology, where there's a, a biological neuron, when we're down electrical single, uh, signals would come down dendrites, if that signal's strong enough, a signal goes down the axon. And that was replicated in artificial form there on the right hand side in a mathematical sense, so if we get enough numeric inputs uh, into a function, then we'll give you an output. When we start to piece those together is when we start to become powerful. So you start to take those individual uh, artificial neurons and piece them together, just like in the brain, we have multiple layers of these. And then inputs can become outputs for others. So we have lots of hidden layers, input layers, and the output layer of the thing we're trying to decide, which I'll, I'll talk about much more later. This is not a new concept um, at all. So, so uh, the idea of neural networks goes back to kind of the 1940s, uh, and a lot of interesting work in the 1950s. Um, where people were using these things to try, they'd realised that we could move away from uh, kind of rules-based AI, where you tried, you know, people tried to write down the rules, and actually move to the idea that we could use data and experience to make things learn. So the more data we could pass through these models, they would start to mimic behaviours, so we'd actually start to get some intelligent results. There was a mathematical stumbling block, but that was kind of overcome in the 70s and the 80s. So suddenly these, you know, these were very powerful and could learn lots of things, but the problem was computationally it was very very difficult even though we had all the maths there to actually compute with any of this you needed computational power to do it and you needed data so we've seen we've all seen the explosion in the last few years of, of, of deep learning and one of those reasons is computation and one of the main reasons is this and this is uh, a graphical processing unit 
So this uh, is the kind of thing you'll find in PlayStations and then Nintendo Switches and lots of things. Anything that's processing graphics uh, uses one of these things. And it pains me when I see, when I see my children on the PS4 playing Fortnite or something. I think, you just, I, you just you, well, you're wasting your time, but you're also wasting valuable processing power for deep learning. <laughs> they, don't, they don't buy it. Um, and the reason is that these graphical processing units are really good at calculating with, calculating with matrices. If you remember your high school algebra, uh, matrices are kind of structured arrays of data. And they're great at trans spinning things around, making things bigger and smaller, exactly the things you want to do on a, on a computer screen when you're doing graphics. But the mathematics underlying deep neural networks relies on matrices as well. So these things are custom designed to do the calculations we need to do deep learning. And importantly, they're very, very cheap compared to CPUs. So we can start to buy lots of these and put them together and build very, very powerful machines to do this computation. So in the last few years, the promise of the 70s and the 80s has become a reality but only because we've got the data. You know, we can have all of the, that computational power and that mathematical complexity, but unless we can line it up with data, then we have, we, we have nowhere to go, really, with deep learning. This is uh, the Stanford review recently for harnessing the power of data in health. Um, and we're at now, as for healthcare data, at 2.3 exabytes. So an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. This is a staggering amount of data. But we've also moved you know, a, a, an annual increase of 48%. So suddenly we've got the opportunities with computation, we've got math math mathematics, and we've got data uh, to start to do this. Why is the data so important? I want to give you a really primitive example, but it's always worth bearing in mind. And this is, I want to do a simple demonstration of the height versus age in months of children. And this is just using the uh, line of best fit stuff in Excel. You could develop a neural network to do this stuff for you. It would be slightly overkill. But when I've got three data points here and I do the line of best fit, I get that, which is clearly stupid. Um, you know, we get to an, we peak it and then we start to shrink, which doesn't make sense. We had a slight bit more data and it looks a bit better, but we're still sort of accelerating in height. You know, it, it's, it's not sensible. Some more data points, we're getting there, but again, it's linear. We're keeping growing forever, which we know isn't true. We throw much more data at it and we start to uncover the pattern. So this is a simple, you know, two-dimensional example here. If you start to move to deep neural networks and we move to more dimensions, it's exactly the same thing. We need that data to be able to tease the right patterns out. You could imagine here that if I wanted to add another dimension, I might add uh, gender. I may add a deprivation score. I may add uh, something about the parent's height. So lots of other dimensions can come in, which means we can refine this to have a better prediction. But it's still true that we need to make sure we've got the data and high quality data at that. This is a second chest x-ray you've seen in 20 minutes, um, which is unexpected. Um, where has machine learning and deep learning been really successful so far in healthcare? Well, it's been in image recognition. Um, uh, so this is uh, work that's been going on at Stanford. This is the ChexNet algorithm, which tries to detect pneumonia um, and, and does extraordinarily well. So the algorithm tries to spot the places where there is uh, obvious signs of infection to augment clinicians to do it. And I think um, there is evidence, it's not there yet, that radiology will be one of the first places where workflow is interrupted um, by machine learning. Other examples, um, prediction of cardiovascular risk from retinopathy th photographs, um, just as a, you know, a fascinating study. And the idea that we can predict risk of heart attacks within 90, with 90% 90 accuracy using routine CT scans. I don't know if you can read that. But the bit that's a little odd about this is this is we can, this is work saying we can predict these almost a decade in advance from a routine CT scan. Now, if you want to do preventative disease and you want to do you know NCD management, then a routine CT scan certainly in, in the UK and in a lot of the world is not is not really an option. It's not it's not a thing we do. Uh, it's not the place to go for uh, to to do that risk prediction. Why have we been doing this work? Well, firstly that. Image, deep learning for image recognition is fantastic. There's been lots of work in many fields, so it's very, very powerful. And secondly, there are big data sets out there. So if you look at, in America, of 100 patients um, who were on Medicare, they're 50 CT scans a year. So there is lots of data in a US context, but does that necessarily translate to the rest of the world? Well, it certainly doesn't translate to the UK. So we need to look elsewhere if we're going to do uh, machine learning at a sort of predictive and preventative disease level. So this is where we come to the EHR. Um, and what we do in the UK is, is 
to try and have that comprehensive EHR data that covers all, all health care settings. So wherever a patient presents, um, that information is available and clinicians are entering into that record, or if it's different systems, we're trying to achieve that with interoperability, um, certainly recently using fire standards to do that, so that we have primary care data, we have mental health data, we have the important bits of, of secondary care data for some of the work we're doing, which is actually, again, around the discharge summary and a coded discharge summary and medication that the patient's received. The scale is important as well. So in the UK, um, our organisation will look after the records of 50 million people. Uh, that's 7,000 organisations and about 200,000 NHS staff members using um, the system on a daily basis. What that means is we do loads of functions per second. There's a lot of data here, and this is, goes back to that Stanford review. You know, this is certainly not all of the UK by any stretch of the imagination, but it absolutely outstrips Visa on a daily basis as to how many transactions you do. So this healthcare data resource really is growing. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've transitioned the database to SNOMED CT. Um, so in, in terms of what we've got on the database coded in SNOMED CT, we've got 16.6 .6 billion um, entries. So that will be diagnoses, symptoms, uh, procedure codes, things about, about uh, ethnicity, place of birth, so a whole range of administrative and clinical codes and the 16.6 billion, which is a fantastic number to start to work with. So what I mean by this, so this is the, the, the opportunity for us to take that EHR and that, that and potentially personal health record data, but I won't get into that today, take those events that have happened in primary care, in hospital and mental health, and take what we know about them, but in an EHR context, to have everything beautifully SNOMED coded. Now, that is not easy to do, and Charles has, has said this, we need to really encourage our clinicians to do it. Um, some of the ways we do that, I think things like auto-completion, when you're typing narrative text, some kind of predictive text to drop the right code in behind, if you select it. Making sure that we restrict code selection to the appropriate thing. So if, you are, if you're entering the history of a patient, we restrict you to the right part of the tree. And, and allowing users to create templates whereby they're not seeing any sorts of codes, and Alejandro touched on this as well, but when they're, you, when they're selecting the option, it's dropping codes onto the record to try and get as rich a coded data uh, EHR as we possibly can. What happens then is those EHR data, they come into my neural network. So these things on the left-hand side are called features. I'm now putting in symptoms and comorbidities and lots of other options into that thing to try and work out, to try and predict, for example, a differential diagnosis for a patient. So it may be that I've come in with a, with a, a patient with a list of symptoms, I've developed an algorithm, and it will give me three, three possibilities of a diagnosis with some probabilistic uh, number attached to them. So we work um, with a de-identified data set, um, so we're in the, in the fortunate position that Charles is searching for, where we have a de-identified data set to do lots of research, or, or many of them actually, uh, based around different projects that we're doing. And I'll just quickly give you some of the work we've been doing. So one of the things we've really focused on is can we have uh, deep neural networks to do early cancer prediction? So we've been working primarily on four tricky cancers with a big focus on ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is difficult to spot. Um, it does have lots of uh, potential differential diagnoses. In the UK, we do diagnose people late with that. So we end up with 60% diagnosed at stage three or four. So pretty poor survival rates on the back of that. What we want to be able to do is to move that into you know, spotting that earlier in primary care without sending everybody to oncology, so doing this in a way where we've got good positive predicted values um, and enabling GPs to have those tools on to nudge them. Um, the tool has now gone into real world, a real-world evidence phase. It's been used by general practitioners in the UK. Um, and For example, the tool is spotting the fact that we, you should consider oncology 50% of the time before the GP has done that, uh, we know from our analysis. What we're doing with that is, one is part of clinical assistance, so what you would class as, as normal clinical decision support, so in consultation prompts. Um, but what we've found is actually, in this case, it's been very well received to do that sort of um, retrospective, so not actually in consultation, but to present a screen where on a daily basis you can see the patients that, the, that would have been flagged up, which you know, enables somebody with a uh, special interest in that or some special expertise in that to review that list and make sure that, that the people are on the appropriate pathway. Um, it's useful for safety netting, it means that no one gets missed, and it's an interesting way of, of, of combating that kind of alert fatigue, but still bringing the intelligence into, into clinical practice. We've also done some work with unsupervised learning, which is um, it's a type of deep learning, but again, here we don't have a label, we're just looking for patterns. And this was, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes, it's a huge problem in Malaysia, it's a huge problem around the world. 
we were looking for unsupervised learning to say, can we find clusters of diabetic patients that look like each other? So rather than us just having standard sort of targets for, for diabetics and treating everybody in the same way, can we tease out clusters uh, uh, where we can have more personalised things? And it's true, we can. So we, we've seen, based on HbA1c HBA1 history and, and other patient characteristics and other comorbidities, that we find multiple clusters of people who are on a stable trajectory, on an increasing trajectory or a decreasing trajectory. And actually, we get different ra uh, odds ratios for them developing complications um, based in which cluster they're in. So actually, there's evidence that we should be thinking about different targets for people, depending on what situation they're in and the state of the disease. And machine learning has been able to help us tease that out. A big piece of work for us recently, um, the actual algorithm here that is in implemented is extraordinarily simple. It's very interpretable. But there's machine learning and data mining underneath. And this was work we did with the NHS and the University of Leeds and the University of Birmingham, where we wanted to say, can we develop an algorithm from you know, SNOMED-coded, structured electronic health record data that allows us to predict the frailty <coughs> of an individual before that, before the elderly person presents in, in crisis. So lots of elderly people present uh, in the emergency department or for an unplanned hospital admission when they are frail, and that's when they get their frailty assessment. But this was, can we do that earlier on um, to try and help people target you know, people sitting in the community who, who are at need of an intervention, uh, but we don't want them to, to have that intervention too late. Um, so we developed an algorithm um, on a research database. We've validated it on another UK research database, uh, and it's now part of uh, the NHS long-term plan and part of uh, GP guidance um, for how they should do their elderly care long-term management. So it's been a nice example that we've been able to close the loop to develop something using uh, data, data mining, machine learning, that create a nice simple algorithm on the back of it, but build that into clinical practice so it's actually getting used and making a difference. So we've seen, for example, uh, that 30% uh, of the people have had an actual geri who, who the, that the algorithm identifies as, as moderate or severely frail have now had that uh, assessment in clinical practice. More recently, very recently, so we're doing some collaborative work now on rare diseases, which again has been mentioned today. Um, you know, rare diseases are a sort of fascinating thing to think about in an EHR context. They are difficult to find, um, but it's a serious problem for us to think about. If it's in, in 2017, if you aggregate all of the rare disease codes, you get to a prevalence of 10%, which is, is kind of in the diabetes uh, number, but we don't really think of it that way. Deep learning is giving us a new way of doing that, so unsupervised learning, on EHR, so again, looking for patterns to try and help identify cases. So, for example, where there's uh, some strange, bio, uh, some biochemistry that doesn't quite add up with something about the patient's condition and clear clinical confusion in the record uh, as to, to no diagnosis. These are interesting for people to look at. Uh, and there's some really, really promising work going on in that space. Away from clinical um, applications, there's lots of applications in process and optimization that still rely on, on lots of SNOMED coding to do that. So, for example, if I take you to appointment length, so we're very interested in can we uh, actually suggest better appointment lengths in primary care for people rather than everybody getting a six-minute appointment. So, if you, again, if you go back, if you've got a very frail individual and it takes them six or seven minutes to get down the corridor and into the room, then what's the point in having a six-minute appointment? Everybody's experience of primary care from then on is affected throughout the day. So, can we use that data to predict uh, do a better job of predicting appointment length and initial results are yes you can you can do some very interesting stuff and start to put people into categories of what appointment you should actually uh, appointment length you should uh, schedule for someone based on their clinical characteristics based on the snowmed coding in their record found some challenges and opportunities so i think there's some really interesting um, possibilities there but there are some you know some serious things you need to consider uh, we definitely need to consider the three on the left there the bias atrogenic risk and local epidemiology. Um, if I just show you an example, if we were trying to do uh, for Kawasaki's disease, which is an uh, inflammatory disease that's often in, uh, occurs in children under the age of five, um, one of the features you would select to look at would be a kind of measles-like rash, uh, which comes up very frequently. And you would feed that into the neural network. And if you kept giving it that data, it would learn that that was one of the features it wanted to do to say, I think you should consider Kawasaki's disease. The problem is if you get your data set wrong, then that's Kawasaki's disease on two different skin colours. Cl clear we've, we've got the a measles like rash, and over here we don't have that. If we've just developed a machine learning algorithm using cases on, like on the left, we're never going to spot the person on the right. 
So there's a real problem that if we don't have either well-coded ethnicity or skin colour um, metrics inside the data sets, or we don't consider that we, we have developed it in a different environment, then how do we translate it? How do we move it into a different country? How do we consider that epidemiology and that potential bias we'll introduce? And on the right-hand side, we've got big problems with the biggest challenge if you are a, uh, working in machine learning is overfitting. So you start to spot patterns that don't really exist. And when you then move that to a different context, uh, your algorithms don't work. Um, to be able to solve that problem, really, and to say we're confident with what's going on with machine learning, we need to be able to do external validation. So we need to be able to take results we've developed, move them to different data sets, and prove that the same thing's going on. If the things we're teasing out are genuinely causal, then we're much less likely to have an overfitting problem. How are we going to do that properly? We need SNOMED coded data sets in, from different environments. If you start to have to change your clinical tools and your algorithms to fit the terminology underneath, you start to introduce a complexity you really don't want. So if we can have algorithms that are based on SNOMED codes that we can move on to different data sets from around the world, then we can start to combat the problem of overfitting. We start to validate um, the work we're doing and actually give clinicians confidence that, this, that, that this is, there's some truth in this and it can augment their clinical practice and it's not just um, sort of a fad for the moment. High dimensionality, again, is a, is a, is a huge problem, um, but SNOMED helps. It, it's reasonable to ask the question, why can't I just list all the findings down this side and all the SNOMED codes here and have some, some, you know, some uber sort of algorithm that works this out for you? And this is a primitive way, but even if they were all on or off of whether you had that symptom, if it was just a finding, you'd end up with 2 to the 35,000 possibilities. And 2 to the 33 is more than the number of people on Earth. So you've got to be really careful that we can't just start adding things in on the left-hand side. It's much more complex than that, but you get the flavour of you, you, there is no panacea here. It needs a lot of clinical expertise. It needs a lot of, uh, of, of literature inputs. It needs guidance for us to create these tools. We can't just think it's a computer science problem. However, SNOMED does help us with the dimensionality problem. Um, we all want our clinicians to record as granular a code as possible, so they're getting you know, the patient record is as, the, as accurate as it can be. But as we've seen earlier today, we do have that hierarchy. We can start to walk up that hierarchy to collapse the dimensions so we get fewer codes, but we're still getting the, the, the sort of the crux of what we're looking for in some of these algorithms to enable us to not have that huge dimensional problem, but still have a really powerful data set. So it might not be that we need the very granular code um, around a diabetic complication, but we need something just a bit higher to enable us to do it. Um, it's not possible in, in, in coding systems without a good terminology, uh, without a good hierarchy. And somebody has been absolutely invaluable for us for that. So there's some challenges. The biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for me for SNOMED, very quickly to finish, I'll tell you is with data sets. If you ask data scientists what they spend most of their time doing, they'll tell you that they spend 60% of their time cleaning and organizing data. That's just, that's just taken as read. It's, it's dispiriting because if you ask them what's the least enjoyable part of the job, 57% say cleaning and organizing data. But it's still a popular job. Um, if we can start to have better coded data sets, if we can start to move away from having to do natural language processing and starting to, to have, do so much work to get the coded data sets and start to convince our clinicians uh, to, convince, uh, to, to start to code things properly, we will have won some of the battle here and we can start to shrink uh, the white portion of that graph and actually get us onto the bit down here, which is mining the data for patterns and refining algorithms, which is where we actually want to spend our time. Um, so good. So, that's it. So I, I genuinely think there's some real opportunities with machine learning now to help our doctors and nurses and our citizens. I don't think it's things people should be scared of. But I think SNOMED's got a fundamental role because unless we do it on high quality data sets and good um, structured data sets at scale, then we're not going to produce things which will, which will help people and will disillusion the community. So thank you very much. <laughs>